tips, tricks, and pearls in vulvar heart disease. Okay. All right. Um, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, again. So um, my job today, actually, I, I'm going to show some of the common pitfalls and then provide you some of the pearl that I have seen in our clinical practice. So pitfall number one is about aortic stenosis. Um, uh, the, most of the time, there is a failure to acquire multiple acoustic views to obtain maximum mean gradient. And when I mean multiple acoustic windows, that means that you can obtain aortic stenosis by various echo, acoustic windows, um, especially the right parasternal windows and the uh, suprasternal view. And uh, there is a, this is an example case, 81-year female um, with Disneyland exertion and outside echo show moderate aortic stenosis. And when you look carefully at the valve, um, you see that the valve doesn't actually doesn't open well, and there is a, um, at least moderate aortic stenosis, um, moderate thickening. And when we look back to the gradient, and they got Vmax of 3.6, which means uh, the peak gradient of 62 and the um, the uh, mean gradient of the uh, 35. I would like to mention about right parasternal view, um, which is a very useful view to obtain the aortic stenosis gradient. Um, it is um, the view that you put the patient in the right lateral um, decubitus position with the right arm extended toward the head, and you apply the probe close to right parasternal around the third intercostal space. And sometimes, especially when the heart is angulated, this is the best view that you can obtain the greatest um, gradient. Um, this is uh, this, uh, the, the, the three-dimensional um, imaging to show you how you can you know, um, try to um, pr uh, move your probe after echo, and sometimes you have to screen like this to get the maximal uh, velocity. And when we apply the right parasinal view with that moderate aortic stenosis, we found that the gradient is up to five meter per second, which is a P gradient of 100 and the mean gradient of 55. And then we change the diagnosis of moderate aortic stenosis to severe aortic stenosis. And there is a um, publication from Mayo Clinic a couple of years ago showing that if you get older and your angle here um, from the LV and the AO um, uh, less than 115 degree, um, the right parasinal view going to be the best view rather than the um, apical view that you're going to obtain the highest velocity. So this is a pitfall and pearl number one that you can change your practice. You'll try this right parasinal view, especially in the elderly. Um, this is... I borrowed these images from my previous sonographer in the at the Cleveland Clinic. So they try so hard to get the images from the left back. This view can be done only when the patient has large um, per, uh, pleural effusion where you can get this. And actually that view has the highest velocity, uh, 84, um, that you cannot obtain from another view. So that 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 just show you how hard they try to get the highest velocities of aortic stenosis to make sure that you don't miss uh, severe aortic stenosis. Pitfall number two is failure to recognize high flow state that causing falsely high AV gradient. This is an example of 60-year-old male who had kidney transplant. And um, uh, do you think the aortic stenosis is so severe? It's, no, I don't think so. And, uh, but the gradient turned out to be um, the peak gradient of 54, while the mean gradient of um, 29. But when you take a look at the patient, you see that he had the um, AV graph that hasn't been used anymore. And what we try is that we ask the nephrologist whether we can inflate the cuff, and he said, yes, go ahead, the patient already had kidney transplant. And we proved that with the cuff inflate, and when uh, the gradient came down to mean gradient of 19. And this is a table in comparison of the cuff uh, 
before and the cuff up gradient, and you can see that the mean gradient changed a lot. So the patient did not have any aortic stenosis and was diagnosed with the um, AS because of the high flow from that AV graft. Um, this is uh, the setting uh, that we call AS in the high cardiac output state, for example, hemodialysis, anemia, or AV fistula that can cause falsely high AV gradient in the presence of mild to moderate aortic stenosis. Um, another <clears throat> uh, feature that can be a hint is that you look at the peak shape of the CW doppler, and if you have very early peaking shape, that can uh, be suggestive of such phenomenon. Pitfall number three is failure to document blood pressure when assessing valvular hemodynamics. Um, high blood pressure, hypertension, and aortic stenosis is like Trojan horse. It just cover um, the, 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 the bad things inside the good things. For example, this is say um, the article about hypertension because when you have high afterload, the gradient across aortic valve can be falsely low. So you need to mention the blood pressure every time you, you make um, that numbers. And when you treat the blood pressure over time and you remeasure, this is especially true in the setting of the uh, paradoxical low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis. Pitfall number four is about aortic regurgitation. It's failure to recognize echo sign of elevated LEDP in acute aortic regurgitation. This is another example of an obese patient who uh, is so difficult to get images. Uh, he presented with severe LV failure and cardiogenic shock. And if you look carefully at the MR, you can uh, appreciate that this MR is diastolic MR. Um, even though the AR doesn't look that severe, but if you have this sign, that means you have very high LVEDP. And you can confirm that with the Doppler, and you can get the diastolic MR signal here. When you have acute severe MR, you have sudden volume load to the unprepared LV, and increased LVEDP cause the premature closure of the mitral valve. And high LVEDP normally, this is the protective method of our body to uh, pr prevent the high LVEDP to transmit to pulmonary vein. But with the higher LVEDP, it opens mitral valve in the acetyl, which exceeds LA pressure, and then you have diastolic MR or early systolic MR. Uh, for example, this is a normal um, Aryan wedge um, curve, and when you have the higher LVEDP, first of all, you have the um, premature mitral valve closure, and then when the LVEDP get higher, you get diastolic MR. Uh, tips or uh, pitfall number five of, for mitral regurgitation is failure to differentiate rheumatic MR from mitral valve prolapse. This is especially true in our country. So sometimes uh, with the rheumatic uh, mitral valve, you have the condition called excessive leaflet mo uh, tips motion. Or some of the surgeons will say is that there is a combined mechanism of Capontier um, um, uh, type 2 um, in the anterior leaflets and restriction or Capontier type 3 in the posterior leaflet. There is a mixed type. While, uh, and some patients call this condition as pseudo prolapse. Uh, where the tips of the anterior leaflet seems to be more mobile and some part of them move toward the left atrium. While the true definition of mitral prolapse is you have to have part, some part of the leaflet that go beyond the mitral annular imaginary line more than two millimeters. This is an example of our real patient who was misly diagnosed with mitral prolapse, but actually turned out to be rheumatic. You can see the restricted uh, motion of the posterior and shorten of the leaflets, and the very uh, mobile or excessive uh, leaflet tip motion of the anterior leaflets. Again, seen in the apical four chamber view, and the pathology turned out to be rheumatic heart disease. Tips number six, uh, uh, the uh, pitfall number six is failure to recognize paravalvular leak in the mitral regurgitation. This is a 45-year-old female who had mitral valve replacement and presented with dyspnea and exertion. And um, doesn't look that he had, uh, she had uh, severe MR. But 
the hemodynamic parameters is very important, and uh, we had to pay attention to the pressure half time here, which is very short at 95. And if you have the short half time and you have the VTA ratio that over in 2.2, you think about pathologic regurgitation. And in this case, uh, we got the half time of 95 and the VTA ratio of 2.2. That is the concerns that we have to think about pathologic rigors, even though we did not see the jet of the MR at all. So we proceed to the transesophageal echo and we see that the jet is so eccentric and, uh, uh, and it caused a paravalve leak at this point and confirm with the three-dimensional echo here. And this is a good candidate for um, transcatheter uh, intervention. Um, so when you have high gradient across mitral processes, pressure halftime is the key. And if you have the halftime less than 130, think about tachycardia or regurgitation or high flow or PPM. Pitfall number seven in mitral stenosis is failure to realize the limitation of pressure halftime method. This is another case uh, that we found recently and the fellow came in with the mitral valve area of 2.2 why he didn't recognize that the patient had the significant ASD with the left to right shunt and this is in the setting of luton basher syndrome uh, concept of pressure half time is like you're doing the um, sand uh, clock like um, if you have the limited um, area here, you need more time to fill the lower chamber uh, of this chamber. But if the mitral valve area is so big, so there is a short half time there. However, um, if you have the ASD, which is that there is a leak of the pressure at the upper chamber, or you have the setting with elevated LVEDP, like a significant AR, this method can be inaccurate or immediate post-PTMC in the 24 to 48 hours. So those are the limitations of the pressure halftime method. Pitfall number eight is tricuspid regurgitation. Is TR velocity can be underestimated in the setting of free TR. If you look at the full formula or Bernoulli equation, you know that there is a large part, um, there is a viscous friction and flow acceleration that we thought is negligible. However, these can be uh, significant in the setting that you have free TR or torrential TR. There is a, a validation, some of the correlation that the um, cath lab RVSP can be 53, while the echo can be just only 30, especially when you have the shape of the TR signal as we call uh, VWF cutoff sign, which uh, make it more triangular. And you have to be very careful, especially when you're sending the patient to the OR and uh, they, may came, they may not be able to come out of the um, bypass pump because of that um, RE failure. So you probably need to do the right heart cath. Pitfall number nine is girl body defect, that mimicking eccentric TR. This is another images um, that the echo came, uh, the fellow came again with the severe TR. But it, the, the jet is just strange. And then um, he got the gradient of 105, which is, uh, can be severe pulmonary hypertension. But if you look carefully, you can see that the chest is so horizontal and it originated mainly from the aorta. And, uh, and at the full chamber, we confirmed that this is a good body defect and that can cause a falsely high RVSP because you mistaken it as a uh, TR velocity. This is another example of the infective endocarditis of the mitral valve that causes a crux abscess. And you can see the good body defect from the LV to the RA as well. And if you mistaken this jet as a TR, you're going to get a severe pulmonary hypertension. So this is another pitfall. Last pitfall, uh, number 10 in infective endocarditis is failure to recognize unusual complications of IE. For example, uh, we reported this case in Jack several years ago about these images. And I, while I was a fellow, I just focused on the uh, mechanical mitral valve here and the vegetations up there. However, there is a hole there in this area that I miss it completely. And when we look at the chest x-ray, we saw there is an abnormal bouch on the left lateral uh, 
wow. And when we did and um, the CT scan, and these turned out to be aneurysms, pseudo aneurysms of the left ventricle, and the 3D reconstruction confirmed um, that images and the patient underwent surgery. So uh, back then, this is another um, unusual um, uh, complications of the IE, which is the pseudo aneurysm of the left ventricle. So take home message for aortic stenosis, use multiple acoustic window expectory right paracinal view, recognize high flow state and document blood pressure when assessing valvular hemodynamics. For AR, premature mitral closure and dastic MR are signs of unprotected elevated LVEDP and need urgent surgical management. For MS, limited use of pressure half time in ASD, immediate post-op PTMC and elevated LVEDP. For MR, rheumatic MR can mimicking um, can, can mimic mitral valve prolapse. On pressure, half time is a key to detect paravalve leakage in the prosthetic mitral valve. For TR, RVSP is underestimated in the setting of free TR, and Gerbody defect can mimic TR with pulmonary hypertension. And for RE, always look for complications. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Any question from the audience? Yes. <laughs> okay, if not, then we'll continue to our next speaker, Dr. Helen Thompson. She's going to deliver how echo assist decision to intervene asymptomatic valve heart disease. <clears throat> we'll just get my computer going. Come this way. Thank you very much. So I thought the best way to approach this was to approach it in form of two cases. The first case is a case of asymptomatic aortic stenosis and the second case is a case of asymptomatic mitral regurgitation. <clears throat> so this is a 58-year-old male flight attendant with a past history of a coarctation repair at age 18 and a known bicuspid aortic valve with known aortic stenosis who presented for a routine echo he was clinically well, he had no symptoms. And these are his images. So we have a parasternal long axis, a parasternal short axis, and an apical four chamber view. His ejection fraction was assessed at 51% and he has a bicuspid aortic valve, as you can see. This is the Doppler. <clears throat> so he has got a mean gradient of 45 and a peak uh, velocity of 4.5 metres per second. So does this patient with asymptomatic aortic stenosis require intervention? When we ask ourselves that question, we always go to the guidelines because they're, de they're there to guide us. And these are the guidelines for surgery in severe AS. Now we all know that symptomatic severe aortic stenosis has a terrible, dismal outcome and those patients should go to surgery. How about asymptomatic patients? If the ejection fraction is less than 50%, we should be sending them to surgery. If they have an abnormal stress test with a drop in blood pressure, they should be sent to surgery. If they have very severe aortic stenosis with a velocity of greater than five meters per second and they're low surgical risk, we should be considering it. And if they have got evidence of rapid progression with low risk, we should be considering it. In addition, if patients have got moderate or severe aortic stenosis and are having cardiac surgery for other reasons, we should consider it. So um, the guidelines um, are drafted from a number of studies, and this is a study um, by Rosenheck, where he looked at asymptomatic patients with severe aortic stenosis, and he looked at what happened to them over time. Now we have this um, idea that patients who don't have symptoms are mostly safe, we can just watch them. That wasn't quite what he found. He found if the gradients were five meters per second or more, these patients did badly. And at 5.5 meters per second, hardly any of them had escaped intervention or a bad outcome by three years. So this is what underpins the um, guideline that suggests that we refer patients on with very severe aortic stenosis, even if they have no symptoms. 
Now, this is a very recent study. This is the recovery trial, which came out in the New England Journal of Medicine in January. Um, it's from um, Kang et al. And this was interesting in that they looked at, um, a, this is a prospective um, randomized study where they had 145 patients with very severe aortic stenosis. And they um, called the patients as having very severe aortic stenosis if they had a gradient of, um, I think it was 50, 50 um, millimetres of mercury, it had a peak velocity of 4.5 and an aortic valve area of 0.75. And they split them into two groups, those who had early surgery and those who were managed with watchful waiting. And they found that operative mortality or death from cardiovascular causes was far less in the patients who had early surgery. It was an interesting group in that the average age was younger. It was in the 60s, not in the 70s, and about two-thirds of the patients had bicuspid aortic valves but this particular trial might end up having an impact on the guidelines. Now, the other thing that's in the guidelines is that um, patients with AS, no symptoms but reduced digestion fraction should go to surgery. And the number that they choose is 50, but it's not all that well grounded. This is a relatively recent paper from Japan, which was a multi-centred prospective study where they found a big group of patients who had asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, and they divided that group into quartiles, those who had an ejection fraction of um, uh, less than 50%, those with more than 70%, and two grades in between. And the patients were divided into patients who had surgery and patients who didn't um, early on. And they found that certainly having an ejection fraction of less than 50%, um, the patients did badly if they weren't operated on. But if your ejection fraction was less than 60%, you did worse um, if you weren't operated on. So again, it kind of encourages us, I think, to consider surgery at a slightly earlier time. And this is a pay oh, there was another paper from um, uh, Mayo Clinic that looked at outcomes post-surgery and found that if you waited until the ejection fraction was less than 60%, those patients didn't recover as well. Now, apart from that, there are... Um, um, things about valve morphology that we should consider when we're considering whether to send our patients on early or not. And Rosenheck found that if the valves were he heavily calcified, it predicted sort of relatively rapid and inexorable um, increase in degree of aortic stenosis. So this was another thing that he felt um, was a marker of increased risk. So we should consider this too. So how does the echo help? Echo is very helpful for assessing severity of aortic stenosis, looking at the impact on the left ventricle, um, looking at the valve to work out whether or not we think that's likely to progress rapidly. We can also do serial echoes to document whether that has occurred, and we can look at the appearance of the valve and the root, and that might affect choice of intervention. When we assess the severity of aortic stenosis, we do it by the continuity equation, and these are the parameters that we need. We need to be able to measure left ventricular outflow tract diameter, a V1 and a V2. We need to do it as mentioned by the previous speaker, from multiple windows, or we can miss the peak gradient. And from that, we can calculate an aortic valve area, which is relatively flow independent parameter. And these are what defines severe um, currently. If the mean gradient is more than 40, equal to or more than 40, if the peak velocity is equal to or more than four meters per second, or the aortic valve area is one centimeter square or less. Just be mindful that the gradients and aortic valve area don't match in low flow, low gradient aortic stenosis, which is beyond the scope of this talk. These patients are also rarely asymptomatic. We can look at echo for the impact on that left ventricle um, with biplane Simpson or with 3D um, Simpson. But that's relatively insensitive and can hide many sins. Patients can have significant damage to their left ventricle before we see a change in ejection fraction. So it's worthwhile doing global longitudinal strain, which is thought to correlate with fibrosis and um, poor outcome post-surgery, lack of recovery of the ventricle post-surgery, if it's reduced. We can look at the valve for calcification, and that can be graded. It may be better done with CT, but it can also be graded with echo, and at the valve morphology. So how about this patient? His EF was 51% and his GLS was 13%. He has a bicuspid valve that's quite calcified. And he has an aortic valve area of one centimetre. And I think his mean, and an elevated mean gradient. 
is this patient truly asymptomatic? Um, he had a stress echo. He went for 12 minutes, which is a very good workload. He denied any symptoms. He did not have an abnormal blood pressure response. His peak velocity went to five metres. His contractile reserve, there was some, but it was reduced. And his RVSB increased from 48 to 73. So what should we do? He has severe aortic stenosis, a borderline ejection fraction, but a significantly reduced GLS, a calcified valve and pulmonary hypertension. Anyone from the audience, any suggestions? What would you do? Yeah, and that's exactly what happened. So he went on and he had an aortic valve replacement, um, somewhat controversially due to his preference with a TAVI, given his age um, and given it's bicuspid. So I want to briefly present this next case. This is a 55-year-old truck driver who had difficulty with his urinary stream. Um, he presented to his doctor for that problem, mentioned he had some palpitations, and when the doctor examined him, he heard a pansystolic murmur. He had an ECG and a halter, which were normal, no arrhythmia was documented, and he had a transthoracic echo, which is this. So he has posterior leaflet prolapse. He has mitral regurgitation, which we quantified with an ERO of 0.44 and a regurgitant volume of 65. Um, with a normal right ventricular systolic pressure. So what should we do with this patient? And again, we go back to the literature and the guidelines. Now, we know the natural history of degenerative mitral regurgitation is not benign, but when it's relatively mild, it's not too bad. The worse the MR gets, the worse the outlook is. And there's, this other paper also shows that. Um, it compares patients with... All these patients had no symptoms. They had a flail mitral valve leaflet. They had a good ejection fraction. Some of them were managed with repair and some of them managed medically. And they found the patients who had early surgery had less risk of heart failure. So what do the guidelines say? Well, with um, bad mitral regurgitation, there's a class one guideline if they have symptoms or left ventricular dysfunction, which is defined as an ejection fraction of between 30 and 60%. Um, and a left ventricular end systolic dimension of greater than 40 millimetres. There's a class two indication for repair if the patient has new AF or pulmonary hypertension. And we thought perhaps our um, patient might fit in this final group. No symptoms, no left ventricular dysfunction, but possibly a very high likelihood of repair. That's yet to be determined and low risk. So how does ECHO help? Um, ECHO is very helpful in looking at severity of the mitral regurgitation and the impact on the left ventricle, the right ventricle, the left atrium. And toe in particular is critically important for looking at the mechanism of the mitral regurgitation and how likely it is you can repair the valve. So when we do ECHO, we look at how bad the regurgitation is and we start with color flow. It's simple um, and it's quick. So I'll show you these images. And you can see in the first frame, there's hardly any regurgitation. And in the last frame, there's a lot of regurgitation. Now, all of these pictures were taken on the one day from the same patient, and all that we did there was we turned the colour gain up or down. You can achieve the same thing um, if you change the scale, and you can also alter the appearance by altering the colour flow baseline. So you need to be aware colour flow has some limitations. It's also affected by physical factors. For instance, if the patient's profoundly hypotensive, um, you can really underrate the MR. So when we do a transesophageal echo, for instance, we have to be quite mindful of what the blood pressure is when we do it because we can um, underrate how much regurgitation there is. So we do like quantification for the mitral valve. It's the valve where it's been best validated. Um, I've got a preference for PISA because I think it's simpler, but quantitative Doppler also can be performed. And these are the... Um, the markers of how, or when we call it severe. So if the ERO is greater than 0.4 and the regurgitant volume greater than 60. We can also assess left ventricular function and again, be mindful ejection fractions, a poor marker of systolic function. You might want to consider doing GLS or stress echo to look for symptoms and contractile reserve. And then what about the mechanism of mitral regurgitation? Adequate function of the mitral valve depends on the leaflets, the cords, the annulus, and the left ventricle. And we need to look at all of these things with echo in order to determine likelihood of repair. And in a case like the one I showed you, it's absolutely critical because you don't want to send a patient like that to theatre to find that you cannot repair the valve when you could have waited. That would be a really bad outcome. 
So we look at the leaflets, we look at leaflet motion. I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Um, we use Carpentier's classification, whether there's normal motion, excessive motion, restricted in diastole or restricted in systole. We also, when we do a transesophageal echo, we draw a map of where the problem with the valve is. So we can look at every single segment of the valve, either with 2D or 3D. Um, and then moving on to the annulus. Um, the annulus is something that I probably didn't appreciate the importance of until relatively recently. It's very important to know whether or not it's calcified. It can make a valve repair very difficult. Um, and um, this is another phenomena that you should look for, which is mitral annular dysfunction. And the reason that you should look for it is that uh, the surgeons tell me that this is often a relatively easy repair. So this is where the annulus in Sicily bows outward rather than coming inward. Um, and they tell me that they can often repair this with an annuloplasty ring and they may or may not need to do more with that. And the other important consideration is there's often more than one mechanism. So I'll go back to our case. You can see this patient's got posterior leaflet prolapse. They've got severe mitral regurgitation. And this is the 3D. Just play it for you. So you can see um, that they've got um, prolapse of P2. That's where the problem is. You can see the jet referable to it. But you shouldn't miss this. There are deep clefts on both sides of P2, and there are jets coming from those. So this is a summary of the case. This patient's got severe mitral regurgitation due to mitral valve prolapse of P2 with a jet due to that, and also jets from clefts between P1 and P2 and P2 and P3. No symptoms, keen for surgery. So we sought a surgical opinion, and here the critical point I would make is you need to have a surgeon who does high volumes of mitral valve repairs with very good results. It's absolutely vital. So this was the operation that he had. The clefts were oversewn, and he had some Gore-Tex cords put in to the posterior leaflet with an annuloplasty band, and this was the final result. So this person has done very well. So in summary, what's the role of ECHO? It can quantify the degree of stenosis or regurgitation, and that's very important if the patients have, are asymptomatic. You want to know that they really have severe pathology before you even think about intervening. It can look at the impact on the left ventricle, and I think we ought to be beginning to think beyond just ejection fraction. It can look at the impact on the remainder of the heart and also the pulmonary artery pressures. Um, Transesophageal echo especially is vital for assessing the repairability of the valve um, in the setting of the mitral valve, and this is vital in determining the timing of surgery. Thank you. I, um, I have problem with patient with um, non holosystolic mitral regard, like you know you got in Barlow's mm. or mitral. Yes. Um, well, some data suggests that they probably do better than um, yep. those. But how would you approach those? We had huge ERO, but it's you know very short for a short yeah. period. I, I, right. I don't think they have severe mitral regurgitation, or rather, they have severe mitral regurgitation, but only for a very short time in mm -hmm. the cycle. So I think those patients, we've got quite good data that it's safe to wait with those patients. If it's not pansystolic, it's it's very unlikely to be truly severe. Would you rely on more, more on the regurgitant volume? Because that's more a time sort of, yeah. Yeah, I think the regurgitant volume is more helpful. So it's likely over time they might become pansystolic and that would be different. But those particular that particular subset I don't think has severe mitral regurgitation. But it's an important point because you don't want to be operating on those patients before their time. Because they, they aren't severe and they don't have symptoms. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Then we'll move on to the next uh, talk. Uh, Dr. Vannon will give a talk about the echo assessment of a right ventricle function and reserve in vulvar heart disease. can see that thing. Oh, I can. Okay. I'm going to focus on TR because I think you're talking on LV dysfunction, right? So I'm going to talk only about the right ventricle and the TR. Um, I'll show you four cases. 85. 
color Doppler, looks like severe TR. Quantitative parameters all supporting severe TR, PISA, and EROA. Dilated right atrium, right ventricle is upper limit of normal. And the usual challenge is RV function in volume overload. This is TAPSI. TAPSI here is 2.9 centimeters. S prime related to TAPSI oftentimes is 15, both exaggerated. Uh, FAC is a valuable parameter in TR, perhaps more important than TAPSI and S prime, exaggerated at 52%. So, um, the only other remaining thing here is to look at RV strain because that doesn't talk about a geometric function but talks about myocardial function. So this is a valuable parameter to look in, just like primary MR on the left side, this would be key on the right side. And here is um, uh, RV free wall strain is 38%. In our lab, using this VVI technique, our cutoff is 24%. That's what we have established in our lab. As I said, this is not very standardized, so it's important to establish your own upper limits of normal. And you can see that GLS is exaggerated or, or free wall strain is exaggerated. So in summary, case one, severe TR, exaggerated TAP, CS prime, and FAC, and strain is also exaggerated. This is the ideal situation, and frankly, I think this is the point to intervene in TR if we want good results, but it is not in the guidelines. This is a fully compensated right ventricle for the degree of volume overload. Case two, 46. RV is mildly dilated, um, severe TR, quantitative parameters that, again, support the diagnosis of severe TR, and question of RV function. Here, the TAPSI. TAPSI is 2.1 centimeters, again, normal. S prime is 13 centimeters per second, normal. Upper uh, cutoff is 10. FAC is 37%, still normal. The upper limit of normal being 35%. RV strain in this patient, we exclude the septum. Here, the RV strain is 24%. Normal or borderline, if you want to, well, it depends on what your inclination is to call it, but 24% uh, is our cutoff, so this would theoretically qualify as normal strain, even if borderline. So here we have severe TR, normal TAPSI, S prime, and FAC, and the RV free wall strain is quote unquote normal. But for the degree of volume overload, that free wall strain should be of concern because you would expect an exaggerated free wall strain just like you would expect exaggerated GLS on the left side in severe MR with normal myocardial contraction. This is case three. Here is an RV that may be mildly dilated, severe TR. PISA and vena contractor supporting the diagnosis of severe TR. TAPSI is 2.1 normal, S prime is 16 centimeters per second normal, FAC is 49 percent appropriately for the degree of TR, and RV strain in this patient, this is again using VVI, is 20 percent in the setting of a FAC of 49 percent. Clearly a decompensated ventricle we have to at least intervene at this point if we want to really make an impact on RV function after TR treatment. Um, this is something we are not doing at the present time because RV strain is not a standard practice, and it's unfortunate because it is probably, to me, the one way of judging what the RV is doing in a volume overload situation. A free wall strain of 20% should be concerning for that degree of TR, even if the TAPSI was 2.1 and the FAC was 49%. So this is a decompensated right ventricle, clearly decompensated right ventricle, despite the normal conventional indices. Case number four, young woman with lupus, normal sized RV, severe tricuspid regurgitation with some tethering of the tricuspid leaflets that you can see, it is pulled down into the right ventricle. PISA, EROA, and vena contracta with severe TR, and 
Tapsi is 2.6 centimeters, S prime is 12 centimeters per second. And here is FAC 52 centimeter uh, percent, again consistent with the uh, degree of TR. Here is uh, VVI of the RV and a free wall strain of 17%, despite the fact that everything is exaggerated, normal sized RV. So the most interesting part of strain to me is always whether it's left side or the right, to or the right side is the normal sized chamber uh, with all normal conventional indices and an abnormal strain pattern. Um, so this should be of real concern in this young lady with severe TR. Um, whether this reflects a degree of myocarditis from lupus is unknown, but that TR is of concern. Um, so this is clearly RV dysfunction, despite everything we know about conventional indices in tricuspid regurgitation. So in summary, if you look at these four patients, all TAPSIs are normal, all S primes are normal, all FACs are normal, uh, and yet, when you look at the free wall strain, if this was a single patient in a longitudinal follow-up, which is not the case, um, you would see that there is a progressive decline in RV free wall strain from a compensated RV to a decompensating RV to a decompensated RV and to frank RV dysfunction, all in the setting of normal conventional indices. And the most important thing is at the present time, the guidelines only recommend symptomatic TR or RV dysfunction defined as the last column um, when TAPC is down. So it's not even in the last column. It is the fifth and the sixth column, which I've not even shown you here, which I believe is too late to intervene in TR. You do not get the maximal benefit. We ought to be intervening somewhere around patient two um, or even patient one, if we want the big, the biggest benefit for tricuspid regurgitation and, and the intervention. This is a current guidelines. It's all about symptoms. That's a class one indication. There is a class two B indication for asymptomatic TR with early signs of right ventricular uh, dysfunction. But unfortunately, that is based on end systolic or end diastolic area of, or end systolic area of about 20 um, so millimeter square, and that is too late. That is RV enlargement and volume overload, and at that point, um, it may be not the fullest benefit. So we still need refinement of um, our experience with TR. Um, it tells us that we ought to be looking at RV very differently than what we know from uh, the guidelines for RV dysfunction. Something to think about in, when we deal with tricuspid regurgitation. Thank you for your attention. Questions? Yes. Normal conventional parameters and then, um, you know, abnormal strain of RV. Do we, because we seems to be, um, um, persuade us to decide on the RV strain. Do we have? There is uh, one piece of data I know from Scandinavia. Uh, I think about 80 patients, so small numbers, and they have shown that abnormal strain in the presence of all normal indices, the outcome is not very good in terms of heart failure and hospitalization, etc. Um, there, there is a data from Leiden, which is their retrospective analysis of the TR group that also makes that same point about RV strain being important predictor of RV dysfunction. We are looking at over, I don't know, 900 patients, prospectively, uh, looking at, because we are a big TR center, we deal with TR a lot. We are looking at it. So the answer is, the data is emerging, it's not there yet, but I, I think the RV strain will turn out to be a differentiator. But, but earlier you were complaining people um, you know, using GLS for the LV, um, in a way that you know they 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 they're not accurately measuring it. So you you think the RV would have the even more problem or less? Interestingly, problem? I think RV strain is a little more easy to standardize than LV strain. Um, partly because you're you're uh, now rightly or wrongly that's a whole different topic. We only we exclude the septum. Um, and we focus on the free wall. Less chances of moving things around. There's not much to move around in the RV. So I think it's, I, I don't know, 
but we've been able to successfully in our lab train our sonographers to do always train and the inter uh, operator reproducibility is extremely high for RV because you're looking at a smaller region. And I think that is why I think it's a little more promising to me. I always say if you want to do strain, begin with the RV before you do the LV. Learn how to do it well kind of thing. But it may not necessarily apply to the entire world, but I think uh, RV strain would be easier to do, relatively. Nothing is easy about strain. Well, what do you think about that uh, RV function from the thumbtack that the uh <laughs> uh, you can get the volume and then uh, just a pediatric patient you look rather than they look at the strain 3D you mean 3D yeah the 3D rather than look so um, you know I do this meeting with Luigi Badano every two years and I know he's on a war path with 3D RV ejection fraction in the adult population in our lab and we are very good trans thoracic we actually report out 3D it's only possible in about 40% of the patients, much more difficult than the LV, not very reliable, not at all reliable. So I don't know where people are publishing. I review some of these papers and I've rejected many of them because they claim they can do it in 80% of the, it's nonsense because when you look at what they show, I can't see the free wall, I can't see anything, but they get an ejection fraction and they run with that thing. So I got to see it to believe that you really have that number. I think Luigi Badano's lab probably have done more than anybody else, and I still have the same argument with him, that it is not as easy as the LV. He says it's up to 70% or 80%. I say 40%. Half the patient, less than half the patients. You try. I, I would ask anybody to go after the RV. It is one way to lose your mind is to do RV 3D. It is very difficult to do. It's not that easy. Even in a good, dedicated lab, it's not that easy to do. Uh, and especially in, the data. In pediatric patients, they rather than go with the EF or this, they focus on the volume. That yeah, and I think RV volumes are important. Even in the adult population, there may be something to be said for RV volumes. Um, but again, that means you've got to get a good quality 3D. Yeah, and if you're in the pediatric, I don't know about the pediatric, in congenital population, the better way to go after RV is MRI in my book. If you can do MRI, that is the best way to do it, not 3D echo transthoracically. That's just my view. We have really, really gone after RV in our lab, and I, I, I don't think if we are, it's very promising on routine basis. You, LV 3D, you can do it in 70, 80% of the patients. RV, half the population. With contrast, how about that? 3D? No, it's difficult. I don't think it's, uh, contrast doesn't work with uh, 3D right now. Hopefully it can, but it's not there yet, if it can be. Um, on the LV side, we have tried to push contrast so that we can do 3D. But again, you need the right software for it. Right now, the 3D transducers destroy the micro bubbles. So you really can't have enough contrast in there. Or it's too bright. It's one of those two things. It's not there. I just wondered whether you had considered, or you probably have, I suppose, doing GLS before. Now you're doing interventions on the tricuspid valve. Yeah. The threshold for intervening, I'm sure, will become lower. Yeah. So you'd have the opportunity of looking at predictability of the GLS before for recovery. So that because we have, yes, you're right, Helen, and I, that's what we're getting after prospectively. So we are looking at all our TR population and we are looking at the natural history, so to speak. That includes endpoints, include intervention, death, hospitalization, etc. So hopefully we can tease out what actually predicts it. Right now we are actually going to present the initial 400 patients as an abstract at uh, the American Society of Echo. And that seems to say strain is a better predictor than anything else for RV dysfunction, uh, both in terms of hospitalization, death, and also the timing of intervention. They seem to come to. But that's just part of, part of the population. We are not there yet. Yeah. I think most of us who um, you know look after a lot of patients with TR, we feel that the, the guideline is too conservative. And, um, All guidelines are conservative. Yeah, especially for the tricuspid no, no. compared to the left yeah. side. Um, what's your feeling? And what, how, why is that so and why, why would... Less evidence. If you know how <laughs> guidelines are written, 
I don't know. I've been part of the guidelines. I can tell you how guidelines are written. And then you won't lose sleep over guidelines. I don't lose sleep over guidelines because I totally ignore them. Because I know how it, if it comes out. There are 20 people in the room. And half the people don't talk to the other half. Because you have people like me who say, that can't be the case. But then there are people who say, well, Pepsi and S prime and all that is important and we can't ignore it. So ultimately, it's a one big compromise. So you write something that makes everybody happy. And the other philosophy that drives guidelines is, it's not meant for you, it's not meant for me, uh, it's not meant for anybody in this room, quite honestly. It is meant for the vast majority of people doing echocardiograms who probably don't have the time to understand TR as much as you do. So they want a simple guide they can use in 90% of the patients they look after. Beyond that, if they don't know what to do, they'll send it to you. Um, so guidelines are written for the minimum standard, not the best practice necessarily. So if you look at guidelines that way, I don't lose sleep over guidelines. Same thing with the aortic stenosis, right? 50% EF in aortic stenosis, I don't know how they came up with 50%. I mean, in aortic stenosis, if you have an EF of 55%, you should be concerned about it. I mean, that ventricle has to be really cranking against uh, the afterload. But 50% is too late. I mean, that is far too late. So the first step that is going to happen in the revised guidelines, and we are writing it, is the threshold is going to change to 60%, which, which is all the data is saying, is 60% or less is abnormal. So that will become class one indication, along with um, symptomatic. That's, but that took a battle to change. You will be surprised. Even after all that 60% data, there are people who say you cannot change it. I mean, what else do you want? I don't understand. So guidelines are, so you're right. You're right, but I, I see your frustration about guidelines. Okay, thank you very much. So, you? I'll you're be fine. next. <laughs> I'm going to give a talk about the echo assessment of a left ventricle function. Look like I don't have anything to talk because <laughs> it's already mentioned. And here's some belief in guidelines. I don't know what I'm going to present to you. <laughs> My talk will be very simple and uh, based on guideline. Uh, echo assessment of left ventricle function and reserve in vulvar heart disease. We all know that echo is a primary modality for diagnosis of a vulvar heart disease to tell severity, look at the LV function, and associate findings of pulmonary hypertension or left atrial enlargement. And uh, it is also essential for telling you the optimal timing for the surgical intervention for the patient and follow the patient. There are different modalities of echo that we can do from MO2D, Doppler, 3D, tissue Doppler, and speckle tracking. And all these, uh, we know the advantage, limitation, and the normal reference value has been given. Uh, studies mostly uh, done by MO and 2D, because MO is uh, quite simple and you can do it, and then a good. Uh, had an excellent temporal resolution, while 2D, had, uh, if uh, there's a symmetrical left ventricle, you can get better image. But there's a limitation of uh, each modality. For the M mode, and then you know that your cursor has to be perpendicular to the long axis of the left ventricle to get a good number and good measurement that will be reproducible. While 2D, sometimes it's uh, quite difficult to get a good image and trace the border of the LV. For the LV volume by 2D, LV or ejection fraction all being given for the, the number of the normal abnormal. We mostly, for us, or general clinician, we would like to look at the LV physical function by eyeball. But eyeball is very subjective, and then there's, a, there's marked inter and intra observer variation and experience dependent. And to look at the 2D, you need to have a good, correct view. It's not for shortening. There's no geometric assumption. And we prefer, if possible, 
get a good quantification. We can do that by getting the biplane uh, measured by the Simpson technique, or nowadays with the uh, the speck of tracking coming and the strain, all this will give us more information about your LV systolic function. And we know from many talks in the past that 3D will give, give, give better LV ejection fraction closer to MR, better than 2D, and it can also give the segmental and global LV function. And nowadays with all, all the high technology, we can get a hard model, the equipment will give us all the measurement, but as we know, Equipment is equipment. We still need to look over and then edit it as needed. For well, our heart disease, as mentioned earlier, symptomatic and asymptomatic, uh, the HA, ACC, and European Cardio, uh, Society of Cardiology give a guideline, give a class of recommendation for intervention and level evidence from A, B, C to and class uh, rec recommendation one, two, three. And uh, for the valvular heart disease guidelines been given, this is since 2014. And uh, as we say for LV function, we look at the LV ejection fraction. And uh, symptomatic, as mentioned earlier by Dr. Thompson, say you is a recommended for valve replacement irrespective of uh, EF or LV size. The patient symptomatic, low EF, go ahead or it that you need to do the valve replacement. If it's there, the pressure gradient is there, the patient meet the criteria, it's a class one evidence B. But for those with uh, asymptomatic is a problem, then we have to follow, look at the EF, if a low EF less than 50%, we discussed about this earlier, in the future, the guideline might change, but what I have now is, the number is 50%, it's a class one and evidence B uh, recommendation. And if the size is low, it's a normal EF and large LV size, uh, then we'll consider as a class 2A evidence B for LV EF uh, and, and then the ejection in systolic dimension more than 50 millimeter or by uh, uh, go with a, um, 25 millimeter per square meter with the basal body surface area. This is the, what the recommendation is. So LVF is important decision making at present for AR. How about mitral regurgitation? We have, we know that there's a primary and secondary mitral regurgitation. Again, we, it has been studied and uh, known that for primary mitral regurgitation, those with AF less than 60%, has a substantial mortality compared to more than 60%. These have been followed for 10 years, and uh, we found that uh, you have a more mortality with a low EF of less than 60%. This is the update guideline 2017, give indication for surgery for mitral regurgitation, symptomatic, if more than 30%, it's a class one for mitral valve risk. Uh, surgery. How about asymptomatic has been mentioned earlier. EF is important coming in and then the decision for mitral valve repair if you have a good experience of the surgeon and expected mortality less than 1%. For secondary mitral regurgitation, if symptomatic and uh, the patient should consider after the initial evaluation, Treatment of the underlying problem, consider CRT, and then still symptomatic, then you should go for surgery. That's a class 2B. Asymptomatic severe mitral regurgitation, then sometimes you have to make a judgment and might need periodically monitor. So EF is important, and then the most important threshold predicting recovering of the LVF was the preoperative ejection fraction study shown that if less than 65 or LV and systolic dimension less than 36 millimeter. So the pre-op EF is important. If EF less than 60% and have a higher incidence of post-op LV dysfunction and also increase incidence of poor outcome. So we need to know and recognize this cut-off criteria and intervene before the, it's too late. 
LV and cystic volume or dimension is simple to get. It's an easy, direct, single measurement. You can measure for, from M mode, and it's a very good in uh, reproducibility to obtain the by echocardiogram. It's uh, independent, re re uh, predicting overall mortality and morbidity in this patient. So LV cystic function is, again, coming as a, in the decision-making a present guideline of if less than 60% and the size of LV. How about aortic stenosis has been uh, nicely uh, uh, given a talk by the cases earlier by Dr. Thompson. Uh, aortic stenosis can be, be true, CV aortic stenosis, the low flow low gradient of products AS. Again, the number is 50%. And uh, as per our discussion earlier, Presently, 50% is a number. <laughs> so if you're symptomatic, go ahead. Surgery is a uh, uh, class uh, one indication for aortic valve replacement. And if asymptomatic, also the number is 50%, less than 50%. So when the patient, you come to a conclusion by looking at the LVEF after you classify a patient into uh, whether low flow gradient, true CVAS or paradoxical AS, when you decide for aortic valve surgery, we have to look into surgical risk. And a lot of talk in this meeting about whether go for uh, TAVA or not. Years ago, say oh, only high risk will go for that. Now they come to the low risk group, whether which approach you should go. So it's beyond this talk. So I'll leave this to you to attend the meeting and get more information. Decision making of LVF is important and it will help you decide which approach you're going to do for the patient. How about the frequency echo that you need to do for asymptomatic patient with vulvar heart disease and they have normal EF? If they are stage B, you can follow period every three to five years. If the, it advances to more the degrees, then maybe one, every one to two years. If the patient gets into the stage C or severe, then Every six months to one year, you should follow the patient echocardiographically. And it's shown that uh, EF is very important in your decision making. So is it the best parameter? It's, uh, so far, it's a more solid predictor of impaired outcome in regurgitation, heart valve. And uh, reduced in EF could be the late consequence and might cause irreversible myocardial injury. So that's why it comes uh, with the straight imaging, try to identify myocardial injury at early stage before there's a reduction of the LVEF. And uh, this can be done and give more information, help us regarding the decision making. Uh, we talk about the, we can manually do it, or uh, this is auto strain. You obtain a nice picture, 2D image in four chamber view, two chamber view, three chamber view and you still need to edit it, even though the machine can do it for you. And it, it can display in the boost eye, give you the global and segmental long, uh, global longitudinal strain, and also can give you the number of the LV volume and ejection fraction. How about the asymptomatic significant aortic stenosis? We have nice case uh, that was elucidated earlier today. And presently, the, from this study, show that the prognostic value in uh, Long LV global longitude strain in AS best cut off is minus 14.7. And you can see in this case, a patient, same presentation, same EF, good EF, but the global longitude strain is different. And the outcome after the follow for 10 years is different too by the cut off of minus 14.7. So, aortic stenosis is mandatory for assessment of aortic stenosis and the class one indication for intervention if EF less than 50%. Uh, EF is not strongly associated with severity of aortic stenosis and not associated with progression. So myocardial impairment occur even with normal LVEF. So the, that's where the uh, strain, LV global longitude strain is coming and there's a given a cut off value of minus 14.7 and has been raised up that it should be quantified and reported in echo report used for decision making and management. There have been uh, some suggestions that new proposed algorithm for 
management of asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis. If we have less than 50%, no question, we ha have intervention. But if we have more than 50%, they consider that maybe we should do the global long chain strain and see if it's getting worse, should go for MR, see whether there's any more cardio abnormalities, and if needed, go ahead with the intervention. How about the uh, mitral regurgitation? This study is just presented recently and also showed that LV global long chain strain is independently associated with all cause mortality. So the cutoff value is a very normal value of uh, presently, uh, it's, a, it's up to the vendors. The number could be from minus 19 to 20, minus 20. So it's up to whatever lab you're doing. I think the best way you follow your patient with the same equipment. So for your number of the global long chain strain, if they say this magnitude less than 19.3%, which is a normal value for normal people without um, mitral regurgitation, it's shown that it has strong prediction for preoperative, for postoperative myocardial dysfunction. How about aortic regurgitation? Chronic aortic regurgitation, asymptomatic, also it has been shown that if the LV global long chain strain was than minus 19% was associated with reduced survival. So look like this is coming, then we have to learn about it. Next is a strain echo. Uh, I'm sorry, a stress echo. Uh, we can obtain many ways, either by treadmill stress or low dose lobutamine or by bike, by bicycle treadmill stress test. It gives us a lot of information and uh, of the valve, at the same token, give us about information whether the LV is contactile reserve or not. These are the numbers that we can look, look into that. It will help us to, make the, to match the symptom that patient has with the cardiac involvement and also help us to risk stratify the patient and decision making in this patient to find the, find the best optimal timing for surgery. So this is my last slide, take home message of all the number that might be helpful and all these number might change as times go on. As I mentioned that the global long chain strain is uh, so far AS is very useful. A MR, AR will need more to validate this. And if there's question, do the stress echo. Thank you very much. Okay, any, any question? If the new card like come on, when, when will that be? Doctor, <laughs> two years. Okay, so get ready to learn the new number. Okay, thank you for attending this section. If there's no further question. Okay.